All right, Jeremy Miner, we are live today here in our Facebook group. So we're using, I love StreamYard because you can go live with multiple, obviously multiple platforms at the same time. So if you are brand new here, so every Wednesday, we typically will interview a client from a completely different industry. Now, sometimes we'll interview clients months apart that might be in the same industry or the same sector or something like that. But every Wednesday, we always interview a client and for them to even be interviewed on this, they have to meet a certain criteria, a criteria of like, they were making this before the training and now they're making this. And this one gentleman that we're gonna talk to, you know, went, was already doing pretty well, was already making low six figures and has now tripled that. We're talking getting up to 350,000 plus and in his industry, you know, you're talking like that is the very top that an individual can actually go. So uh, we're going to bring him out here, going to ask him some questions about what he did to actually get to that level. We're going to go over some different questions that we taught him how to ask, especially with this tone that took him to the next level. Little nuances that maybe you don't know yet because you're not one of our clients. You wouldn't know this from the free reels or you know, basic YouTube videos I put out there. That's just basic stuff we put out compared to what our, our clients learn in our in our virtual training portals and group training. So we're going to give you some of those nuances on there. All right. Now, if you are brand new uh, and you just sort of follow me, like maybe here in the, because we're going live on StreamYard, so we're going live inside the Facebook group Sales Revolution. There's almost 90,000 of you in there. That thing is growing rapidly. All right. So we're going live in the Facebook group Sales Revolution. We're also going live here in the Facebook business page, 153,000 of you on that one. That's growing. And then we're also going live here on YouTube, about 22,000 new subscribers just in the last 30 days. So we're finally putting some effort into some YouTube with some basic stuff we put up there with shorts and different things. All right. And we're also going live on my personal Facebook. Now, if you just started following me, my, my name is Jeremy Miner right here in the, the green shirt today. Uh, I'm the founder of Seventh Level. Now, Seventh Level. What do we do? We're a sales training organization that trains salespeople exactly like you watching me here. So we train sales professionals like you. We train sales executives like you, salespeople like you, entrepreneurs, business owners, coaches, consultants, contractors, really anything that has a product, service, or anything that is sold. And we train you and your teams how to use specific questions and techniques that work with human behavior rather than work against it. And what am I talking about that? Those are called NEPQ. It stands for Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questions. Now, not only are we going to teach you the right questions, which this gentleman here, we're going to show you what some of those questions are, okay? But we're also, somebody keeps calling me like multiple times in a row here. No caller ID. That makes me a little bit skeptical who that is. So not only do we have to train you the right questions to ask, but more importantly, what do you have to learn? You have to learn how to ask them and why you're asking them. So we have to teach you the right tone. Certain questions, if you've heard me a little bit, maybe especially if you're a client, if you've heard me talk about, there's certain questions that have to be asked in more of a, a curious tone. There's other questions that have to be asked more in a confused tone, which draws them in. And I'll show you what I mean by that. It doesn't mean you don't know what you're talking about, completely different. There's other questions that require more of a challenging or skeptical tone. There's other questions that require more of a, a concern tone, a tone that shows more empathy. And then there's other questions that are more playful. Okay, when do we do that? So we're going to show you some differences here today. We might even, with this client's permission, because he's in our advanced inner circle program, that is at the, the highest level, uh, you have to be making a certain amount of income to even get into that program because it's very advanced. Uh, we might even show a few abs, you know, parts of his script with the questions we taught him and actually role play. Would that help you if we role play that with you today? Maybe you'd like that certain questions. All right. Now I want all of you to ask questions today. So I want you to ask questions to this guy right here that I'm about to interview this client. And I'm going to pick probably the top seven to maybe eight questions because we're going to go for about 40 more minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. And we will actually answer those questions for you right now. If you're on the live right now, here's what I'm going to have you do. Go down to your phone. I know you guys are on your phone. And I want you to post hashtag live. So if you're on your phone, well, you're all on your phone right now, right? So go down to the bottom in your comments and post hashtag live. I better see tons of hashtag lives between 
the Facebook group and the Facebook business page. There's about a hundred of you on here between both of those pages. All right. So go post hashtag live. I better see a ton of hashtag lives. You guys better get on it. If I'm going to have him share with you how to sell more. So I want you to go post hashtag live. Thank you, Michael Ryan. Very kind of you. Good job, Luke. Okay. Now they're starting to come in. Allison, Mike, Luca, Brandon, Pamela, Andrew, Facebook user. Okay. Now you're coming in. Zach, Daryl. Thank you very much. Juan. Okay, so if you're on the replay, go post hashtag replay. So if you're on the live, hashtag live. If you're on the replay, post hashtag replay. Now, I'm going to have you smash the heart button, and I'm going to have you smash the like button. So smash the heart button, smash the like button. I better see tons of smashed hearts and smashed likes with what we're going to share with you today. I better see tons of smashed hearts and smashed likes. All right, let's bring the legend out here. All right, Jim, how are you, man? I'm doing pretty well, Jeremy. I'm doing pretty well. How about you? You know, just being the boring guy, trying to stay <laughs> out of trouble. What about you? You in trouble over there? I'm trying to stay out of trouble myself. Gonna go shopping for hairspray later. You remember possibly. that one? You remember that one I told you when you get on Zoom? Because you mainly do inbound leads, right? That's true. That is yeah, true. Yeah, so you mainly do inbound leads. And when they come on, oh, what are you doing? Uh, you know, just surfing the web looking for some better hairspray. Yeah. So if you're bald, use it to your advantage and yeah. really open them up. Have you actually used that? You know what? I have a couple of times and it worked really well. It really disarms people, believe it or not. There you yeah. go. All right. So real quick, uh, let's give you a little two, three minute background and we'll sure. jump in with some knowledge bombs to help these people sell more. And I want all of you on here asking him questions like, hey, how did you go from 100 grand a year to 350 or whatever you're making? Like, how did you make that jump? That's kind yeah. of crazy. What industry are you actually in, Jim? What do you sell? So I'm selling a software as a service product, but mainly to associations and professional societies, and then also nonprofits and normal private companies. Okay. But really, it's actually, it's kind of a niche. It's the association and professional society space. So you sell SaaS. Mm -hmm. uh, and how long have you been selling SaaS in this type of sector? Uh, since the very end of 2014. So I've been at it a while. Quite a few years. Yeah. Well, with same company or different companies before? I've been, I was actually the third sales hire at the company that I'm still at, yeah. Wow. And, and how many salespeople are in your organization? So we were acquired. So now I think all told the sales staff is like 20, 30 people. Yeah. Okay. And you guys were bought out by somebody yeah. that's in your company. Mm -hmm. All right. So, we're, so congratulations. All right. Yeah. Now, when did this all happen? Because you were already making yeah. low six figures. And, you know, what I always say, salespeople, for the most part, who make low six figures, have really huge <laughs> egos. Yeah. Right? They think they know everything there is to know about selling. They're in the top 10% mm -hmm. in their in their company. And so they're like, I know everything. I don't need to do, I don't need to learn more advanced skills. But for you, sure. what caused your mind to be like, hey, I'm making low six figures, but man, there's things I'm missing. I should be making yeah. three times that. So you know what it was is that it's not like like you know, I was still um, beating quota every year in, in this yeah. type of thing. Yeah. But there were so many times during sales where yeah. I felt like I was just ad libbing and the outcome of the sale was depending on did I have enough energy drinks this morning? Were the moons in alignment? Was I like on? It wasn't it wasn't coming down to um, what it really should have been, which is like yeah. training and executing on something that actually works. So nothing was, was like, really predictable for you. Yeah. And so, and the results were really inconsistent. Yeah. Okay. That could be trouble. Um, All right. Now I believe, cause I started talking to you a little bit before this and you're in our advanced inner circle. That's a very sure, yeah. smaller group training program that we do that. I'm the one, yeah. you know, mainly involved along with Marco and Matt, but what caused you, I know you found us about a year ago. First of all, what yeah. caused you to be like, Hey, I need to look for this. And then how did you even find us? So what happened was in Q4 of last year, and I think this actually happened to a lot of software sellers, all that magical free government money went away and shocker, yeah. it got really hard to sell. So the and lay had, downs were not there anymore. They were gone. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, I actually need, you know, yes, we've, I've had other sales training. Yes. I've read yeah. a bunch of, you know, sales and persuasion books, but what I've got now isn't getting it done. And there are prospects coming through that I should be able to help, right? Like they're actually a good fit, but yeah. I'm not able to get them there. So there has so to they be have, a better way. They have problems. Yep. And your solution solves those. So you're like, hey, what's the missing link, right? Like have problems, my solution solves those. What caused you to feel like the missing link might be just your own sales ability wasn't to that level yet? I, I would say that it was just getting on there and feeling like there were times when I was like blanking out, like, what do I do? How do I handle this? And I would go back to the previous yeah. sales training that we'd had 
Mm. And there was like, even though, for example, they'd say, well, gosh, tonality, it's so important. 70% of what you do is tonality. And I'd be like, okay, why? But there's not, you're not telling me what but to what do. What tones did I use? Right. <laughs> okay. So it was all theory and you just had to figure it out on your own. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk to the folks here. Let's talk sure. to them. Let's give them some ammunition they can use. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, obviously you're an advanced inner circle yeah. training. So that's me. And like I said, small groups, different industries. We talk a lot about learning how to disarm the prospect. Sure. And then we help you make any PQ specific to your industry. Uh, maybe give us a, a good question, you know, cause in your, with what you do, you mainly do inbound leads, right? Mm -hmm. You have an SDR that uh, books the appointment and you're talking to what more like a C-level executive, the first uh, Zoom call, right? You know, what's, what's interesting is that with my role, and this mm -hmm. is part of where NAPQ has helped so much, yeah. it can be anybody in the organization. So frequently yeah. it's somebody really high up on the totem pole, okay. but it could also be somebody at the very lower level mm -hmm. who's getting negatively affected by whatever they're using now. Yeah. Okay. And, and what problems really does your software solve. Why don't we explain that to them yeah. so everybody knows because your industry is more niche specific. Yeah, it's pretty niche, but it's a big problem that I would say most SaaS products solve, which is saving time by replacing a really manual process. That's the biggest one. The yeah. second biggest one is our product integrates with all the other systems that these clients are typically using. And so that that really helps them too. Yeah. Okay. So what, okay. So they, they have, they, they know they have somewhat of a problem, but maybe sure. they just don't understand the depth of it, how bad it is. Yeah. And especially they don't understand the consequences of what happens if they don't solve it. Right. Right. So they show up on the zoom. What, what was a good connection question that we taught you yeah. initially to ask and in with the tone mm -hmm. that started to get the prospect into more results-based thinking initially, rather than like, price or cost-based thinking? Just give us an example. Yeah. So a really, a really good question that I'll ask is we get a lot of demo requests. So yeah. when I get one, I'll say in a vaguely confused tone, like I'm just not sure what's it, it looks like you'd submitted a, a demo request. Was there, um, was there something you maybe saw on the website that caused you to want to have a, a conversation with us? Yeah. So it looks like you, you booked, uh, you, you submitted like a demo request. Was there something you you saw in there that caused you to maybe want to look into this further. Now, why would we use a confused tone with that mm -hmm. question? Because that sounds counterproductive. Most of us like, you can't act confused. You got to act on point and know exactly what you're talking about. That prospect's going to feel like you're not smart. Why yeah. would you act confused there? Because our tonality hits the prospect's subconscious brain before their conscious brain. And if I sound confused, what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to help me understand, well, yeah. well, Jim, you just don't get it, Jim. This is why I need to talk to you. Yeah. And when they do that, they're reminding themselves why they wanted to talk to us. A confused tone, especially in the beginning of that conversation, causes them to interpret his question he's asking is, yeah. oh, he's not understanding why I submitted that. I need to explain that better or I need to clarify that better. Yeah. Now, what that psychologically does, what Jim is saying this is the reason why I have a background in behavioral science, everybody. You're welcome. The way the brain makes decisions is that confused tone causes the prospect to be like, oh, I need to clarify that. And because they clarify to Jim, they're also clarifying it to who? Themselves and their own mind, which reminds them why they were even looking in the first place. That is why we use a confused tone in that scenario. Now, there's a lot more to that. There's a question you asked before that, and there's a couple connection questions after that. Let's take a question here from somebody. I think this is a good one. Somebody said organized confusion. I love it. It's called skilled confusion. I like that there. Okay. Uh, what was the most difficult part of Indi uh Here's a question here by Eduardo. What was the most difficult part of NEPQ to integrate for you? Good question. Man, you know what? That's, that's a really good, I think the overall, the most challenging, but so far the most rewarding part has been figuring out how to adapt the general NEPQ framework that we have to a multi-call process. Yeah. Because that in, in B2B, it's not just a, a one call close. We, in, in my industry, we're doing like typically a three call process. So I had to figure out how am I gonna use all these amazing options that NEPQ gives me to get the prospects where they need to go yeah. depending on where we are in the sales process. Exactly. Now we teach some of that in NEPQ 2.0 because that's like a 14 hour uh, virtual training course. 
We teach more of it in 3.0 because then it goes to 45 vir hour virtual training course plus training calls during the week. But we really teach that what you're talking about yeah. advanced inner circle because it's industry specific and I'm the one training you how to do that. Yeah. Now, how did that help you maybe navigate? Because we talk a lot about how do we navigate if you're in B2B? How do yeah. you navigate and pull in all the other decision makers, not even the decision makers, but also people who can influence yeah the decision maker. They can't make the final decision, but they can definitely influence that decision. How did you learn that? <laughs> well, you know, you really, I, I had to seriously train at and master the princi the principles, right, of NEPQ. And what I mean by that is I have to figure out, maybe we're on a phone call as we frequently are with not one or two folks from an organization, but three or four or five, right? Yeah. And you have to develop the flexibility to know as we're discussing maybe one issue that's happening, yeah. that issue is going to impact all of these different stakeholders differently. So Definitely. how do I have that fluidity to go from one person to yeah. well, how, how are you seeing that um, manifest in, in the, in the membership department yeah. though? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because really? what about you? Like the manual stuff might not affect you as well, but what about you with, with this area? Like how, what, what is that doing for you when that happened? Yeah. Right. More specific. Okay, good. Now, another question here, I thought that was good from Kenneth. What are commonalities between NEPQ and what you were doing before, or yeah. what were you naturally good at when you initially implemented NEPQ? So I am not nat not naturally, quote unquote, a salesperson. I'm like a highly logical weirdo introvert. I would have never picked myself as a salesperson. Yeah. Our old sales training, it was okay, but it was developed during the Nixon administration, right? Mm -hmm. So it was developed like 50, 60 years ago. Yeah. And for its time, I think if you, if you had done well, what you would have done well with that, NEPQ took what I already knew right? Some of these like outdated, less effective sales techniques. And it was like, just like light years ahead of those. So there were some commonalities, but realistically, I used to start my calls with an upfront contract, which sounded yeah. like a police interrogation and generated so much sales resistance that like half the call. Okay. You got to give us an example because a lot oh of times gosh. in B2B, a lot of times in B2B uh, sales, and that's been really taught since the seventies, yeah you know, and I know the methodologies that teach that yeah, sure. and they used to work a lot better back in the day, but yeah. it causes a lot of sales resistance or they'll be like, yeah, that sounds fair. And then they just stay surface level the rest of the way because they feel like you just try to do that. So at the end you can close them to go to the next appointment or whatever. But what did you used to say with the oh upfront contract? It was like, you know, I've, I've like tried to get it out of my <laughs> mind. Be like, now, Jeremy, we had 60 <laughs> minutes set aside for this call. Does that still work for you? And if they're like, no, I don't, yeah, because now you're like, now they're like, oh, I don't know, like, uh, it's, I it's didn't realize over. it was going to take this long, but let's reschedule, and then they never show yeah, up. And then I'm going to have some questions for you. Are you okay if I ask those? And you'll probably have some questions for me. Are you good asking those? And it just just sounded like this bizarre thing, and I was just like, yeah. we're supposed to do this every time, right? Yeah. I don't, you know, doesn't sound human. No, so it, no. it doesn't sound natural. It sounds like a sales call. It sounds like you're going to interrogate them, right? So even if they agree, they'll just emotionally shut down. And you probably notice when you ask good questions, they just give you vague, generalized surface level answers. And they yeah. still wanted to think it over. Exactly. The conversation. Exactly. Whereas when we do the confused tone and then we do everything else that you all teach, people mm -hmm. just naturally open up because we're working with human nature. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's so they feel comfortable opening up. Yes. And it's it's yeah. so different because especially in that first two minutes, I'm sorry, I'm ranting here, Jeremy, in that first two minutes of the conversation, if you can do this stuff correctly, yeah. um, you know, like we've learned mm -hmm. the entire rest of the trajectory of that conversation is totally different. Yeah. They start to emotionally open up rather than staying surface level. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's keep moving on. So, you know, there's some other connection questions you have to ask for your space, not just that one, of course. Then we want to help the prospect understand and really know what their real situation is. So what's a good situation question that we've trained you? Because there's about, I think, five or so we asked for your space. What's one good one? And then how does the prospect respond to that? So a really good one is if yeah. the prospect is telling me that they have a system, which frequently they do, that's very manual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll ask them. So how and how how long have they? Uh, how long have they made you do it that way? Yeah. Now, why do you use the word "made" or "make" you do that way? Why why would we put that word in there? Because 
we're we're in the United States, like you say. We're in we're Americans. We hate being made to do anything. Yeah. Um, and it reminds the prospects that they didn't get a choice in this, right? Yeah. And if they did get to choose, what would they actually want? How long have they been forcing you to do it manually, though? Now, why would I ask that in a concerned tone there? What does that do? Because mm -hmm. it's going to let the prospect know, hey, I'm worried about you. That's probably not good. And see, it gets I'm seeding yeah. doubt. I'm seeding doubt without saying, that sucks. They shouldn't be doing that. How long have they been making you do it that way? I'm automatically seeding like, oh, something could be wrong. Like, oh, yeah, this. See, I'm, I'm, tr I'm seeding doubt in their mind without telling them, in your case, that doing it manually really sucks. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now there's more to that. Let's take another question here. Uh, I think this is a good one. If you have, okay, so uh, yeah, Francis, if you have a two call close, at what stage would you pitch? We don't pitch, Francis. Pitching is for average salespeople. Uh, at what stage would you ask for another appointment in order to maximize the show rate? Is that what he's asking? If you have a two yeah. call close, at what stage would you ask for the appointment to make sure they show up? That's what he's asking. You know what? There's, there's, without, there's no way to know without knowing your industry and your sale. But the nice thing with the NAPQ script is you can chunk it up for these B two B calls and kind of pick a very organic transition point, right? Yeah. So that's what I've got between my first and my second call, my yeah. second, and my third call, where it feels yeah. very natural to just, yeah. well, of course, we should set up the next call. Yeah. So typically, in most scenarios, if we're if we're in a two call close or more, so usually most B two C business to consumer. Most of the time, not all, it's usually one call close. Sometimes there are two call close. It can be sold home improvement sometimes and you're selling pools. Luxury pools might be a two or three call close because you got to do proposals, design, stuff like that. But in most B2B examples, most, you're going to have more than a one call close. Obviously, Jim, yours even at three call close is is pretty short cycle compared to a lot of uh, different industries, right? In B2B. So typically, we want to help them at least feel or see that they have a problem. So we have to build a gap. We have to connect with them, connection questions. We have to help them find out what the real situation is because most don't understand that. And then we have to start build a gap with problem awareness questions. So they at least see like, oh gosh, I, I didn't know my situation was like this and I do have some problems. So it makes sense for them to book another appointment because if we can't help build any gap or they don't feel like there's any problem, they're either A, going to be like, well, yeah, just get back to me, send some information, or they're going to be B, yeah, let's book, and then they're going to flake and not actually show up to that appointment, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, we'll go through some more questions here. These are some good questions here you guys are asking. Um, let's go to problem awareness. Mm -hmm. What's a good problem awareness question we trained you to ask, and why do we use it? So actually, you know what? This is a little bit less obvious, but one of my favorite one is <laughs> My favorite ones is in a concerned tone when people yeah. bring up the problems they have. Yeah. It's actually just asking them how long it's been going on. Like a probing because, question of it, but yeah. Yeah, because I, I feel like that's when the gears really start turning and they begin to consider how long have I been dealing with this? And then they start asking themselves why. Yeah. Yeah. They start to question themselves why they've allowed it to keep yeah. happening. Right. So, oh, how give us a problem that somebody would say so let's say that they're having to do so much manual work that they're working nights and weekends and they don't get to see their family yeah how long so when you when you're working like this how how long has that been going on see i'm using a concerned tone right why would i use a concerned tone there when i'm even asking so oh how long has that been going on compared to how long has that been going on for See that concern tone draws them in. They feel like I'm concerned for them. They're like, oh, it's been going on for the last two years. Having to work that many hours, has that, has that had an impact on you? Oh my gosh, you have not. Well, in what way though? Boom. How do you, because a lot of times, because yeah. in the four industries I sold in, okay, my 17 year sales career before I started seven level, two were B2C, two were B2B. And I always remember when I went into B2B, they're like, Jeremy, you don't understand. People will not let you ask questions here. They just want to know the price. They just want you to show them what they have. And it's like almost they, they weren't human. I'm like, well, maybe the question you should be asking is, how do I get them to open up? Because maybe you just haven't learned how. Because they're still a human being. They still have emotions. They have emotional needs. They have problems. I don't think they're from planet Exron, right? They're, I think they're from planet Earth. And so when you learn how to do that, it becomes easy. So yeah. these people, B2B, C-level executives and higher, how are you opening them up compared to what you used to? 
So really, I, I feel that it's down to the tonality and also the verbal pacing, because yeah. when you're using that concern tone effectively, mm. and even if you're having to ask maybe sometimes a longer question, when you really pace it out so it resonates, yeah, they start to really get emotional about the problem, and then yeah. they start to open. And it's important because um, people make their decisions emotionally. So if you're sure. not getting that, how are you going to reliably influence them? Yeah, it's because the, the questions they've been taught to ask are mainly consultative surface level questions, mm -hmm. and you're going to get surface level answers in return. That's typically what most B2B salespeople are taught. They're taught more like product terms. Hold on one second. This number keeps calling me 20 straight times. I want to make sure it's not one of my kids. Hold on. Okay. Hello? Hello? Cannot hear you. Okay. I guess the telemarketer really wants to get a hold of me. So a lot a lot of times, you know, they 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 have these technical terms, yeah. industry specific terms. And because when you ask questions fast, what happens is in the brain, you're not giving your prospects enough time to actually think about the question you ask them. So because you ask it so fast, they just give you a knee jerk answer that's very vague in surface. So you wanna slow down the question you're asking. You do that by what's called verbal pacing and verbal pausing that allows them to lean in, hang on to everything you're saying and asking, and it causes them internally to think much deeper about the question. And when they think deeper about the question, they open up emotionally. Doesn't matter if it's B2B. Doesn't matter if you're talking to the president of the United States. It's all the same. Okay. They're, people are human beings. All right. Let's go through another question here. Uh, somebody on the Facebook group asked, this is a really good question. Um, let's see. Did you do 2.0 or 3 or did you do NEPQ 2.0 or NEPQ 3.0 prior to Inner Circle? If so, how much did that training help you prior to moving into Inner Circle? So that's actually an interesting one. I went right into inner circle because I was, um, I was so, but you know, we don't allow that anymore. You probably, I don't know. If you know that. <laughs> it's probably a good idea. Um, yeah. if I had to do it all over again, first of all, I wish I'd started much sooner with NAPQ obviously, yeah. but, um, I would probably do the 2.0, 3.0 inner circle. Yeah. Cause I feel that you would then get the maximum amount of improvement yeah. out of each step in that process. Yeah. So by the time you get to IC, you're really ready to take advantage of it because you're getting yeah. like access to Jeremy. The, the, average the average client who's an individual that purchases our sales trainer training starts in one of the versions of any PQ 3.0 Pro. Now that is where the average mm. person starts. And then after they've been certified and completed that, then once they've hit a certain income, we let them graduate into inner circle. We actually only let 50 people a month into inner circle. So there are some months after a week where we already close it down and then you have to wait three weeks before you can get back in. 2.0 is usually somebody that maybe couldn't get the funding for 3.0. And so they're like, I got to get in something so I can at least maybe double my sales and then kind of go up there. But yeah, we don't actually, I don't even know how you got in a year ago because I think a year ago we had uh, something in there where you had to make a certain amount of income to go from nothing into inner circle. And it's very strict on that. I don't think we even allow that anymore. So you're lucky. Okay. That was a good question. All right. What's a good solution awareness question that gets the prospects to start focusing on what the future looks like once the, the newfound problems are solved? Yeah. So a really good one is if you're, if you've asked, if you found out what they're really looking for, mm -hmm. you can maybe, and you have to do this the correct way. You have to actually verbally pace it out. So it really resonates and they, and they can feel it, but you ask them if you came in, to do those things like you do with your other clients, how do they feel that that would really help them the most? Yeah, give us a, a specific, yeah. like some type of problem. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Put it into one of your solution awareness questions where they start to like tell yeah. themselves how they see it, you know, helping them. Yeah. So, well, so let's say we we came in, you know, like the other associations that that we help with their awards programs, and you know, we streamline the submission and review process. Um, I know we, you were really saying you wanted to automate the emails. We could set that up where everything's actually automated. You're not going to have to do it manually. So help you out yeah, there. One second. This number literally has called me like 40. That's all times. good. Just make sure it's not an emergency with somebody yeah, that we know. Fun. Hello. Hello. Okay. We cannot hear you. If you're calling me, I cannot hear you. So weird. It's like 40 straight times. A really a telemarketer really wants to get a hold of me. Yeah. Okay, keep going. I cut you off. <laughs> oh no, it's all good. 
So let's <laughs> say, yes, yeah, so let's say we, we mm. automated the emails like you'd said you really wanted. Yeah. And then we would integrate your system with the awards uh, management platform, which I think you'd said was like the highest priority. How did you see that helping you the most? And why do you ask that question? So you integrate this, we yeah. do this. How do you see that benefiting you the most? Why, what does that question do for what you sell? So it starts getting me the tangible surface level benefits of if they were to use what, what we can give them. And what do they typically answer to that? Because it's more surface level yeah. question, surface level answer, and then we're going to emotion open them up with yeah. a question right after. What do they typically say to that? I'm going to get my time back. The members will be happier because it's going to be easier to do this. Oh, um, the technology stack, the technology is going to be so much better for us. Yeah. And then you say quickly. And, and then I say something. Oh, well, be, but, but getting your time. Well, and if it's a time issue, we actually, we worked on a specific question, but where yeah. would you like getting that time back? What would that do for you even personally? Yeah. What would you do? What would you do the extra two hours a day though? Mm -hmm. Oh, what would it do for you personally? See, I'm, I'm getting their okay. emotion out because they're going to give you logical. Like, oh, yeah. with the extra two hours a day, I'd be able to have more time with my family or I'd be able to get this task done that my boss is breathing down my neck that I can't do because I'm yeah. having to do all this many. What would, that, what would that do for you to be able to do that? What would that do for you to get your boss off your back? Oh my gosh, it relieves so much stress. See how we're opening them up emotionally, even B2B C-level executives yeah. and decision makers and higher. All right. Now, uh, consequence questions. Actually, let's go through a couple questions here. Uh, Nimi, I think, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Nimi Brooker on uh, YouTube. I'm from Arkansas. We don't want to pronounce names down there. Says, how was your first month in comparison to your second month? If you can remember after beginning any PQ, that's an interesting. Yeah. It, you know what it is? So they'll, they remind you, don't switch over fully, especially in my case where I was totally new to NAPQ. Like, what the heck is this? A consequence? God, can I even ask that question? I don't know, right? Yeah. And so in the first month, I only made a couple changes. And what was interesting, though, is that I had this spate of sales right off the bat yeah. just because of the tweaks. And then it dipped down for a couple weeks Yeah, because I was still sort of figuring everything out. Yeah. And then at that point, it kind of just went like vertical. Yeah, because we always train you like when you get into our training, you don't switch over to NEPQ 100% in a week because you don't know what you're doing, right? If you don't understand even why you're asking the questions in the first place or how to be flexible if they answer it differently because you just you've gone through the portal one time, you, there's no you can't switch everything over. So you start making we train you how to make smaller tweaks. You're going to add this question here, add this question here, change your tone here. And even those smaller tweaks you'll start making more sales. Now, are you going to double or triple? Probably not. Are you going to make an extra 30, 40%? Maybe your first month? Yeah. And then within a couple of months, after you've been trained and you've gone through the training and you're going through it every day, then you make the switch because now you have certainty because you know what you're doing. Okay. And that just, because if you have uncertainty, you switch over and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. The prospect said this, I didn't know what to ask next. You're dead. Even your old approach would work better, even if it sucked, because you have more certainty in it, even though it doesn't work that well. So we'll show you a few small tweaks that first month to make to get more sales, maybe 20, 30, 40%. And then that next month, a little bit more. And usually by that third month, you're pretty much full bore and you're just going vertical like Jim talked about. That's a really good question. All right. Uh, consequence question. Give us a good consequence question yeah, that we've trained you how to ask. And, and why do we even ask that? Yeah, for sure. But what if you don't do anything about this? The judges keep leaving. You keep losing all of your time. What, what happens to you then? So what if you don't do anything about this and these judges keep leaving and you keep having to spend this time? What would happen to your job at that point? Right. If they're if their jobs at stake, yep. maybe because their boss is like, hey, this is not a good process. We need to fix this. And they can't figure it out. Now, how do they react to that? So usually the most common response is like, oh, we, we got to do something. And they actually don't want to, yeah, they don't want to say what would actually happen, but yeah. I'm okay with that at that step in the process. And what do they say? Like, oh no, we got to do something. What do you immediately ask? Oh, is it time, time for a change possibly. Yeah. Okay. So time to make a change possibly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And then you're transitioning into the next step, which is a next step appointment. Typically, how do you do that? How do you smoothly do that for what we've trained you? So it's interesting because that can be a little bit different on every call. But my general template is, 
oh, okay, well, you know, if it's appropriate, really the next step would be, and then maybe that's really the next step would be setting up a, a demo where we can look at how, you know, we've helped other folks doing, you know, the same things you're doing. Yeah. So I think you'd said that you and maybe the executive director, and there were one or two volunteers you wanted to include. Is there a time, uh, let me pull up my calendar here, and then I, I would set up the appointment. Yeah. And then how do you help them? Uh, you know, get other decision makers and influencers involved yeah. to be on that demo. So you're not just doing the demo on them. And then they're like, yeah. well, let me take this back to everybody else and see what they think. And then you're dead. Yeah, sure. Well, how did your, um, how, how did X person feel about you all getting a system, you know, to help with the awards so that you could get your time back and the judges weren't having issues with it anymore? Yeah. Oh, she felt really good about it. Really? Oh, okay. And then I would just basically ask, well, do, do you feel like it would make sense for her to be on the demo so that she can ask any questions that she might have? Would it help? Her, would it help yeah. her if we if we invite yeah. if we had her on the demo so she can ask questions so she can ask Would that help her more if we did that for you guys? Oh, that's a great idea. See how we're almost making it advantageous for them and the other yeah. person to be on there, not like oh, uh, you know, like begging and hoping they get on. Yeah. There. Yeah, that comes from a place of like lowered status. We want to raise our status. Okay, uh, let's answer a couple questions here. I think we got some other good questions yeah, sure. here. Uh, okay, this is a good one from a Facebook user. Let me see if I can get on here. This number is still calling me. This is crazy, crazy over here. All right, so let's see what this person says. All right, um, what was your most, no, actually, that was a good one. Um, Okay, Mink, I, I think M or MNK Grills. How do you get to this point to get to ask them all these questions? How do you keep them interested in the first one minute of that meeting if you've never met them before? So basically, yeah. how are you getting them to let you ask questions? <laughs> well, I think that that goes back to how critical just the first few minutes of the conversation are. So what's yeah. interesting is in the inner circle, Jeremy will actually review your calls, right? And so... What's interesting is you can talk about, well, around minute 15, Jeremy, this problem was really happening. And he'll be like, yeah, yeah, go to the first two minutes of your call. And you can typically break down in that first 60, 120 seconds or something, the things that you did or didn't do where you established your status or you lost it. The prospect was put in fight or flight mode or they were disarmed. And maybe you got them into results-based thinking, yeah. right? Where they're thinking about, oh man, this is why I'm here because I really want this versus like price based thing. Oh, just tell me the price. I don't, mm, yeah. you know? Yeah. And a lot of that is determined. Channel. I can quite literally review a call and within the first one to two minutes, yeah. I can tell you what objections you're going to get or not get. And I can tell you if that is going to be a closed sale or not a closed sale by listening to the first few minutes of your call. The sale is typically won or lost at hello. I will tell all of you that. Now there's more you got to do because you can actually do a really good job at the first and then totally bomb in the middle, not build a gap, or your presentation sounds like a chemistry lecture and completely lose them, even if you built a gap. So there's other things you have to learn uh, to get them to emotional open up. But it all starts at hello and getting them to let their guard down. Because if you trigger sales resistance, you might not even think you're triggering sales resistance. But when you ask questions, if you're getting vague, generalized, surface level answers, that actually means within that first one or two minutes, the tone of your voice, okay, or what you said or questions you asked actually triggered them to emotionally shut down and stay surface level. And that sale is pretty much over most of the time already. You're almost wasting your time. I can tell you that for sure. That's a good question. Um, okay. And then we have, because remember, who has the problems? They do. Who has the solution? You do. You have to act like that, okay? Not the other way around like most salespeople do, hoping and praying in chase mode. Good Lord. All right, and then we got a question here. On average, how long did it take you to make a lot more money with NEPQ? I think uh, Sabri from yeah. uh, YouTube has that. So that's, um, it actually happened pretty quickly, all things considered. So I hit, so I started actually really attending the inner circle classes in January of this year. And I set an all-time company sales record in Q2. Yeah. Now that said, I took the training like very seriously, which is 100% what I would recommend. But the once I really dove into it, um, 
you know, I started noticing big, big changes like fast. Yeah. Now let me give a disclaimer uh, yeah. to all of you here. Cause my concern is a lot of you are going to, now, I don't know if everybody knows we have over 18,000 plus testimonials yeah. in the last two and a half years. That's more than any sales training company, even that's been around 30 to 50 years. I will tell you that. But my concern for a lot of you listening is that you're going to feel that if you get into our client training, like as a client, like Jim is that, you know, some hocus pocus, you ask one question, you go through the portal one time and all of a sudden you're going to triple your income. I want to be very real with you to become a top 1% earning salesperson. You have to put in time to learning the skill sets to do that. That doesn't happen by going through a virtual training portal one time or attending one training call or watching me on some free basic lives on IG or, uh, you know, a few basic YouTube long form videos. You are not going to quadruple your income for Jim and the tens of thousands of our clients who are getting those type of results because he's talking about more than tripling his income. They had to do what? They went to the portal multiple, multiple times. They showed up on the training calls, even when it was maybe inconvenient for them. And they role played, they rehearsed, they worked on their tonality. Jim is still in our inner circle program a year later. A lot of our inner circle clients will renew another six months, another year, because they want to keep acquiring skills to keep making more money. But it requires dedication. It requires commitment. And it requires you wanting to acquire those skills so you can make more money. If you are lazy and if you never want to get on training, you don't want to go through training calls, you'd rather listen to Taylor Swift all day and sing your little heart out, which I love Taylor, no offense, then I don't want you to think you're going to quadruple your income. And you, you'll probably even going through a portal once make more sales. But if you want to make a career chain and make a ton of money, you got to put into work to learning the skills. Would I be right, Jim? You would be 110% correct. Okay. I just want to put a disclaimer on there. You have to learn how to do these things. You, you can't just show up from a free YouTube video and be like, hey, I didn't triple my income. What the hell, Jeremy? <laughs> like this, These are skills. Acquire. You have to acquire these skills. You have to put in the effort to do it. All right. Uh, this is a good one from another Facebook user I actually uh, like here. It's a B2B question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eric, question for B2B with multiple decision makers. Do you always ask for a sale? live during a meeting call or do you ever want to leave them with the decision still open and a plan for a customer to follow up with their decision well yeah. do you, let me ask you do you want to leave a meeting with your customer going to just ambiguously follow up with you at some point or would <laughs> yeah. you rather leave with them having committed that what you've got is really going to help them get yeah. where they're wanting to go and everything works and, and all of that. Yeah. When we get to that point where, see, so like what, with Jim with multiple yeah. decision makers, he's getting them to make micro commitments that yep. lead to like, those are smaller commitments, smaller steps that lead to the larger step of purchasing his solution to solve their problems and get what they want. So after that first call, he's getting them a micro commitment to book a demo. After the demo, he's getting another micro commitment to go to the next call where he meets all, you know, the other decision makers. And at the end in your sales process, cause you do a three call close, yeah. you're asking commitment questions to get them to commit, to take the next step mm -hmm. and purchase. And then you're telling them, here's what the next steps are. Would that yes. be appropriate? You, you never, if you leave at the end of your sales process, like, Hey, just get back to me at the end of the week and blah, blah, blah. You're going to lose 95% of those deals because life happens. They get busy, they get distracted and they don't move forward. Right. That's so true. Yep. Yeah. I've even had a B2B sales who be like, well, yeah, I mean, after the first call, I just tell them like, hey, I'll get back to you later this week after you've kind of gone through what we went. And they're like, I'm, I'm just not sure a lot of them just aren't getting back to me. I'm like, well, no, no SHIT, Sherlock. Of course, they're not getting back to you. They get busy. They forget yeah. about you, right? That gap you built, which got them on that emotional high, guess where it is three or four days later? Starts to go back down. Right. So you have to get smaller commitments, the next step demo, the next step proposal, the next step meeting to lead to that larger commitment. If you want to make a lot of money as a salesperson and help a lot of your prospects. That's the thing. Jim, any last words of advice before we uh, end the uh, in the call today? Any last words of advice you give somebody brand new to sales or even a vet? Yeah. You know what? I would just say you can always go from good to better and better to best. And so if that's what you want with your sales career, you're looking at the guy to take you there. Maybe.
We're not that cool. Just possibly. Yeah. Just possibly. Just going out on a limb. Maybe we might be able to yeah. help you. I've dealt with tens of thousands of clients in every industry. Just going out on a limb. You might be able to learn from a guy that, you know, made multiple seven figures a year in commissions as a salesperson like you guys. Just going out. I mean, we might only be able to help you make a few extra thousand dollars a month. Now you got to put in the work. There's no magic dust that we're going to sprinkle on you. You got to learn the questions. You got to rehearse them. It's just like an actor actress. Why does Julia Roberts or George Clooney get paid $15 million a film compared to the guy or gal that's been in Hollywood for two decades is still waitressing or being a waiter because Julia Roberts and George Clooney put in more work. They were more dedicated. They were more committed. They rehearsed more. They role played more. And that's why they're in the top 1%. So as a salesperson, just like an athlete, just like anybody who's really successful, you have to put in the time to actually acquire the skills. What is the biggest expense you have in life? Your lack of knowledge. That is the biggest expense you have in life. Because if you're a salesperson, you're already going to work 40 plus hours a week, whether you close or close more than you are now. Whether you don't close or you close, you're still working the same amount of hours, right? So why not acquire the skills so you can help a lot more people get where they want to be, your prospects, and you get paid a lot of money for that. That's how the economy works. So if you want to, if you had the right knowledge, like Jim, looking back a year ago, if you already knew everything you knew now, like you had the right questions, you knew the right tone, you, you had the right body language because you're on Zoom, they can see in those things, you know, even a year later, if you had started with that, you'd be probably way higher than where you're at now, right? The only thing that holds a salesperson back from making the income they want, the only thing that holds them back, the number one thing is their lack of knowledge. They don't understand the right questions. They don't understand how to use their tone to get their prospects to let guard. They don't know how to prevent objections from even happening in the prospect's mind. When you don't know how to do those, how can you expect to sell a lot? Uh, you know, that's the hopium drug. Hope and pray it's going to work out. All right, everybody. Thanks for being on. Uh, Kevin said, hey, Jeremy, is it possible for an introvert to be a top dog salesperson if he learns his lines? People tell me I have the wrong personality to get into sales. Oh, man. Answer that one, Jim. Yes. Yes, it is possible. You can do it. <laughs> Jim's an introvert. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, there. OK, let me ask you this, Kevin. Were you born... Or was anybody born out of their mother's womb with advanced questioning skills? Anybody? Anybody born with advanced questioning skills on here? Oh, no. Anybody born with advanced tonality skills on here? Oh, no. Anybody born with advanced objection handling and prevention skills? No. Those are acquired skills. Okay. Can an introvert learn how to ask questions? Can they learn how to use their tone to get the prospect to let their guard down? In fact, extroverts, we actually have to train them how to talk less. Because usually we find a lot of extroverts that talk a lot are usually average salespeople because they talk themselves out of the sales. I, we, I mean, I could, yeah, I, could, I could list you thousands of introverts that are crushing in every industry. It has nothing to do with asking the right questions at the right time with your right tone. So hopefully that's a good question right there. All right, good. All right, Jim, thanks for being on here. Now, should you learn these skills? Now, here's what I'm going to ask you. Type in me if you want to start making at least 10000 a month with what you're selling right now. Type in me. Type in me in the comments if you're a salesperson and you want to make at least $10,000 a month in commissions with what you sell now. Now, some of you are like, Jeremy, 10,000 sounds good. Inflation's really high. I need to make more. Type in me if you want to make 15 to 20,000 per month in your industry with what you sell now. Type in me. And some of you, okay, there's a lot of you like, oh yeah, that's me. Type in me if you want to make more than that. If you're like, man, that's really good, but I want to develop the skills. I want to develop the sales ability to make 25. Maybe I want to make 30 or 40,000 per month in commissions with what you sell. Type in me if that's you. Now, what does that require? Can you work twice as many hours as you're working now? You already work eight to 10 hours a day. Can you work 16 to 20 hours a day? Probably not. So if you want to triple your sales, let's say that, what do you have to do? You have to acquire a much higher level of sales ability 
than what you've been trained so far, right? Because if you don't, how will you ever make that type of money? You can't. Now, does that mean you can log into our virtual training course and in 30 minutes and not do anything, you're just going to triple your income? No. To acquire those skills, like any profession, you have to put in the time like Jim has, like thousands of our clients are doing. You have to learn. You have to role play. Type in me if you're committed to taking the time, even if it's 20 or 30 minutes every day, or even while you're driving around your car to acquire those skills so you can make more money for your family and the companies that you work for. Type in me if you're committed to taking the time to acquiring those skills. Because in order to be one of our clients to make that type of money, you're going to have to put in the time. I hate to tell you this. This is a this is real sales training. You develop if you put in the time and you role play and you're on the training calls that we do and you're in our virtual training courses, you're going through the video trainings per day. Well, we have 18,000 plus testimonials and we don't even ask people to post them. Those are people that just post them randomly. OK, there's probably a lot we don't even see now. If you are the person that are committed to putting in the time and the effort to acquire those skills with us and you want to make that level of income, what's your next step? Message me directly right now. So if you're in the Facebook group, Sales Revolution, or if you're in the Facebook business page or my Facebook, message me directly right now. If you're on YouTube here, you'll have to join the Facebook group. There's the uh, link there right in purple, salesrevolution.pro message me directly right now. That's all you got to do now in the DMS. Okay. Now, if you can't figure out how to message me, just post hashtag NEPQ in the comments, post hashtag NEPQ and we'll message you back. But in the DMS, <coughs> I won't be able to respond to all of you. There's between YouTube and the Facebook group. There's 121 people on here between YouTube and the Facebook group here on StreamYard. I won't have time to message you all. So when you message me, myself or somebody in our team will message you back. They'll have some questions about what industry you're in, you know, where you're at right now financially, like kind of what you're making, what your closing percentages are compared to what you want your closing percentages to be. And once we understand what you're saying and maybe not asking, that's holding you back from making that amount of money or getting your closing ratios up there, uh, then we can suggest probably have you book with one of our account managers. They'll go through. We have like 36 different training programs. Like I said, it's all dependent on your skill level you have now compared to where you want to be. Once we understand what your current skill level is, which your commission checks tell us what your current skill level is. Let's just be real. You are what your commission check says you are, right? Nothing more, nothing less. Let's be real. John Madden, your record is what your record says it is if you if you watch football. Once we understand your skill level, then we'll recommend which of our training programs is going to help you the most master sales the quickest so you can earn more money. OK, or if you're a business owner, so you can scale your salespeople because we have different uh, sales training for different industries. If you own the business as well, that are different than just our sales training for an individual. So message me directly right now or post hashtag NEPQ and uh, somebody on my team will message you back. Thanks for everybody being on here. I hope that was helpful. Every Wednesday, we always interview a new client, completely different industry. We love all of you whether you're a client or not, and we're only trying to help you sell more. We are a sales training company, and typically that's why companies and individuals come to us so they can sell more, not sell less. All right, everybody. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week and message me directly right now if you want to sell more. Bill Thomas, I'm in a meeting with one of your account managers tomorrow. Good for you, Bill. Just open, just, just be open. Tell them what's really going on. The more open you are with us, the more we know how we can help you. The more closed off you are, we don't know how to help you. Okay. So if you want help, open up, tell us what's going on and we can help you. We train your industry as well. Thanks everybody. Love you guys. See you soon.